This is why you'll never become a true senior engineer using Python. Sure, you can write clean idiomatic code, follow solid principles, and implement design patterns using high-level abstractions. But the harsh reality is this. If you don't understand the underlying mechanics of the system, memory allocation, data alignment, and runtime behavior, you're trying to anchor a skyscraper on shifting sand. Oh, All the Python sheesh. developers out there. If you can answer the next three questions without chat GPTing the answer, I'll be impressed. What causes a segmentation fault? How many bytes does a float? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Impressed? What causes a What causes a segmentation fault? The main that's the function integer you know and this will cause a segmentation fault. As PTR is a null pointer. So I'm guessing that that int PTR is what causes a segmentation fault because it's equal to null. But if PTR is, yeah, because it's equal to null. Oh, yeah, so it's going to return zero. Hopefully I'm right. A segmentation fault. How many bytes does... All right, how many bytes does a float take up in memory? XDR defines the single precision floating point data type as a float. The length of 32 bits of four byte floats the length of a 32 bit or four byte okay how many bytes does a float does a float take up in memory floats are encoded using free iee standard how many bytes does a float take up in memory all right so the, see we he said gpt so how much Floats in a uh, memory. So that's all I need to know. A single float in a memory table four bytes thirty two. Well, all right. Yeah, he fucked me up with that one, low key. I'm a dumb. I, I, he fucked me up with that one, my nigga. He was a bitch ass nigga, low key. Hold on. How many f bytes does a float make up? So how many bytes in a flow? Flow tick they take a couple bytes. Since one byte is equal to eight bits, thirty-two is equal to four bytes. Eight, six, and twenty-four, thirty-two. Oh yeah, because it's one bit, right? So how many bytes does a flow take up in memory? Four. Is he giving us the answer? Does a float take up in memory? What is temporal? What is temporal spatial locality? I I ain't gonna get that one right. Locality. These are I things ain't. Python conveniently hides. It manages memory for you, yeah, automatically running garbage collection in the background. To become a true senior engineer, you need to peek behind the curtain of abstractions. I'm going to give you a glimpse into C, a language where you take full control of memory management. Yo, I ain't gonna lie to you. Low key, I was able to navigate around some of it. I don't even know if I'm right, but low key, I, I was able to tackle it because I know Unity. I worked with the Unity team when they were doing the AR VR type training and they use, I believe, C plus plus or C. Boy, that was a rude awake. That was, yo, that was one of them. I, I didn't grow into JavaScript. I wasn't one of them niggas when I was self-taught. I learned that, that, that gangster shit, boy, that objective C only, boy. That bitch was hard as shit. That shit was so hard. That shit pushed me into this. And I'll be like, yo, y'all niggas are struggling with JavaScript and all of that. And I go back into the OG languages. Some of the syntax errors will leave y'all niggas stuck for ages. Like y'all niggas can't even comprehend what type of errors a nigga was walking into, bro. Fuck breaking a computer. That shit might have you angry at the world when you figure it out, boy. That's why some of these senior devs is so fucking angry. Some of these CTOs is just so like, um, <laughs> bougie. Like, you feel me? Like, them niggas is like, I'm not trying to experience another bug in my system. Think, my nigga, think. That's the language is hard as shit. 
and at the heart of C's power lies malloc, the function that lets you dynamically allocate memory. There are no safety nets, no garbage collectors, no invisible optimizations. In the C standard library, malloc is responsible for allocating memory on the heap as requested by your program. When you call malloc, it takes the number of bytes you want to allocate, finds a block of free memory on the heap, and returns a pointer to that block. The memory is dynamically allocated, which means you get to decide how much memory your program needs during run so time I was right. than at compile ah. time. But what's happening inside malloc? When you call malloc, the system oh, reserves the bitch. on the heap. Yeah, I'm about to start challenging niggas to love coding challenges, boy. The heap is different than <laughs> the stats, which is automatically managed by the system to handle temporary data, like function call frames. The heap allows you to dynamically allocate and free memory as needed, giving you more control. But C doesn't know the types you're working with, so when you allocate memory, you must specify the number of bytes needed. This is where size of comes in handy. It's used to determine how much space you need for a particular data type. For example, if you want to allocate memory for three integers, you'd use the following expression. Here, low key, I don't know how to feel because I maybe you don't have full control of trash management. But definitely, and this is just experience working in Python, um, when you're training machine learning data and stuff like that, you have to have a designated cache to store some of the information. So like you may not have control of the trash collecting and stuff like that that you do do. But after a while, I mean, at least for me, I started to understand where my trash was in my project. And for the average user who doesn't know C, um they might learn a lot using that watered down python and then moving into c it may be a learning curve i'm not saying it's not but it may be an easier transition than if you just uh i guess someone like me who just hopped into that bitch because trust me that motherfucking c was hard as shit dog that shit was like it was such a learning curve i just liked programming but that shit i could see why niggas get into college and change majors bro like, for real, that shit not for the week. <laughs> Them motherfuckers will test you. And, like, not on some regular test on remembering shit. They gonna test your logic, my nigga. Like, they gonna, you gonna say something, they just wanna know why you saying that, bro. Like, and if you can't explain why, nine times out of ten, you know, you're not confident in your reasoning or your problem-solving skills. Size of int ensures that the correct amount of memory is allocated based on the system's definition of an integer size. This makes your code portable because it adapts to different system architectures. Since malloc returns a void pointer, a generic pointer, you often need to cast it to the appropriate type. For example, when allocating memory for integers, you cast the return pointer to an int pointer. One of the most important things to remember when using malloc is that if you try to allocate more memory than the system can provide, malloc It'll return no pointer. Yeah, nigga. Failed. And once you're done with dynamically allocated memory, it's oh. your responsibility to free it. Yo, I'm just happy because he said if I could answer one of these shits without chat GPT, he would be impressed. This for all y'all tech bros under my fucking love, nigga. Eat a dick. Eat a dick. Ah. Ah. It's a... Uh... The free function. Failing to do so will result in memory leaks, which can severely affect the performance of your program over time. Best practice is to not only call free, but also to set your pointer to null to avoid using memory that has already been free. Been free, okay. okay. But at an even lower level, what really happens during malloc? At its core, malloc operates within the heap, a memory region dedicated to dynamic allocation. To efficiently manage the space, the allocator tracks used and free blocks. It does so using a free list, a linked list of memory blocks that are available for allocation. Each free block contains metadata which includes the size of the block, which tells malloc how many bytes the block can hold, as well as pointers, which link the block to the next and previous free blocks in the list. When you call malloc, the allocator searches the free list for a block large enough to satisfy your request. One of the most critical tasks handled by malloc is alignment. Alignment is the key reason why malloc can't simply return any block of memory. Modern processors are optimized to read and write memory when data is aligned to specific boundaries. For example, a 64-bit system often requires memory to be aligned to 8-byte boundaries and misaligned. 
store that a memory address that is a multiple of eight. Oh, that's why it's 64 bit and the 32 bit, I presume, is a uh, four bit aligned. Am I right? Let me know in the comments because I'm learning this shit on the fly, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? Hold on, four, eight, twelve. What the fuck? That's eight, right? Eight times eight, 64. Eight, six, and 24. 32. 40, 48, 56, yeah, 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 so four, yeah, so it's four times eight, that's 32, so it has to be a 32 bit, because it's four bit aligned, you know what I'm saying, and this is, this is the hardware part of shit, yo, stop fucking playing with me, boy, you feel me, I don't need to learn languages, I'm very good at math, blind memory accesses can lead to inefficient CPU operations, for example, multiple fetches instead of one, some architectures may even throw hardware exceptions if memory is not properly aligned, so how does malloc ensure alignment? First, it rounds up the size. When you request n bytes, malloc rounds the size up to the nearest multiple of the system's alignment. For example, if you request 13 bytes on a 64-bit system, malloc will actually allocate 16 bytes to satisfy the alignment constraint. Yeah, because this is about eight. Align the pointer. The allocator adds padding to move the pointer to the next align address, and this is done using a bitwise operation. In practice, you don't need to worry about alignment in typical usages of malloc because the allocator handles it for you. However, if you're working with custom allocators or certain system-level programming, alignment can become important. It's also important to note that unlike calloc, malloc does not initialize the allocated memory, which means that the memory contains arbitrary data, whatever was left in those memory cells. Okay, but how about the edge case where there isn't enough free memory in the heap to satisfy your request? In this case, malloc may request more memory from the operating system, and this is done through system calls such as mmap or sbrk. sbrk increases the program's heap by a specified number of bytes, and gives malloc additional space to allocate from. Let's say before, the heap ends at address 0x1000. After calling sbrk and passing it 4096, the heap extends to 0x2000, which provides an additional 4 kilobytes of memory. On modern systems, malloc often uses mmap for large memory allocations, for example, over 128 kilobytes. mmap maps a file or device into memory, but when used with special flags, it allocates anonymous memory directly from the OS. So the memory is not part of the program's heap, which is managed by the allocator. mmap returns memory that is directly allocated from the OS's memory pool. It's important to remember that this allocated memory is distinct from the heap and does not go through the standard heap management mechanisms, which is useful for large allocations that are too big to be efficiently handled by the heap, and it does not use the heap's free list or block management mechanisms. Understanding how malloc works and the low-level memory handling it involves provides a lot of insight into systems programming and helps you write more optimized and performance conscious oh, yeah. code. If you learned something new today, please drop a like on this video and subscribe oh, for more hell yeah. Oh yeah, this was a great breakdown of why it's not, it's satire. It's not that you can't be a senior engineer using Python. It's just the idea that Python members only need Python when it's like the question what language you should learn is not the question you should be asking. It should be what project you want to make because the project you make will give you a, a tech stack that'll give you optimized code you know so like if you're writing a project in python for example you might have a trash collector written in c or you might have something written in c to control some of the malloc and all of that stuff that you're trying to offset on the hardware um you just don't know and in regards to like the language c itself i would do a disservice making it seem that i've used it in a the same manner as him, I was on the dev uh, team for AR and VR for Unity, but I believe they use C++, not even C, if I'm not mistaken, right? I just know that is a, a object-oriented language, um, and it's I, I look at it, and it looked similar to C, so I just automatically like kind of knew the syntax that I was reading. But overall, if you guys don't have that knowledge, I would be doing you a disservice as to telling you just to learn it for that specific reason. I would tell you learn how to problem solve. So that way, the questions you ask are more catered to what tech stack you need. Um, Because you might not ever need to be a senior engineer using Python. But just in the event you do have a project that might utilize Python, 
for a client that might want to utilize Python, you could present yourself as a senior engineer with some of the problem solving techniques you can um, provide to the user. And, um, great video indicating what you can and can't do. Um, thank you. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and yeah, we out of here.